So let me first recall some uh, definition and notation we used yesterday. Um, so we defined the stratum of differentials of type 0 type mu to be the modular space parameterizing so Riemann surface of genus G with the abelian differential omega so x is genus G and omega is a differential whose zero is of type mu where mu is a partition of 2d minus 2 So we learn several properties of the space H mu. So, so first, it is a complex manifold of dimension. Equal to the two time genus plus the number of distinct zeros minus one. So where this number comes from the rank of the relative homology. So secondly, so this space for a special uh, partition mu, it may be disconnected, right? <coughs> Up to three kinetic components. <coughs> okay, but this only happens when the signature mu is special. For example, if you want to have this. Um, uh, spin structure, then all entries mi have to be even. And if you want to have these hyperloop structures, then mu is also very special. So for general, mu is connected, but only for special one. So to make the notation easier, so when I, from now on, when I see the strata, when I write down h mu, I really mean to focus on like one connected component. It does not matter if it's disconnected, then the claim will just work for each connected component. So let me put a remark. So from now on, so, so I usually mean strata. Or if I write a h mu, it just means like one kinetic component. If the space is disconnected, OK? <coughs> All right. So let's continue with the last thing I mentioned yesterday. So there is a special action called GL2. Okay. So this action I explained. So if you take omega and represent it by a polygon in the Euclidean plane, this action is really by linear transformation. So the central question, well, if you have a group action, you want to study the behavior of the orbit. And now we are in a, like a good geometric space H mu. So when you take the orbit, actually you want to take the orbit closure and see how the closure looks like. So the central question is to study the And I'd like to explain what do I mean by take the closure. When I say take the closure, I need a topology. I believe most of you, if you do L geometry, then so clearly you want to take the theoretical top topology, right? Defined by using polynomial equations. Nevertheless, here, so if you think of H mu, how did I give it a manifold structure? So I wrote down a local coordinate given by period coordinates. That's, that is, I integrate omega against some path, right? And these period coordinates are not quite algebraic. They are like essentially some transcendental coordinates. So when I say the orbit closure, first I really mean this is 
not the theoretical closure. But later on, I'll explain the relation after introducing some results. But so far, maybe as a remark, this is an important remark. So here, so I use the analytic topology. on the space H mu. Where does this energy topology come from? Induced from the local pure coordinates I introduced yesterday. So pure coordinates, let's recall these are the integral of omega against a basis of um, the relative homology. I'm seeing this Local coordinates, they are only like a analytic coordinates, not quite algebraic. So you just view this as a, like a local, really a small neighborhood in the like a complex space of this many dimension, and then that induces the topology. But we know the HMU is a quasi predictive variety. It is a quasi variety. It sits inside the Hodge bundle. So you could take the stereoscopic top closure, but so this GL2 orbit closures was um, for those people who don't study up geom geometry. So they study dynamics. So it's more natural to them to take the like uh, analytic topology. Okay. But I'll mention the relation if you take the risk topology later. Okay. The first. So you may wonder. So if I take the orbit closure in this sense. So whether it always, sometimes, you know, if you do dynamics, you would like to see there is a maybe ergodic behavior. That means the orbit just goes around the space uniformly, and you take the closure to recover the total space. That would be very nice, right? Um, so there is such a result, but it only applies to a general orbit. So let me write down a statement. So if you, so this is a classical result due to measure and not independent by which. I think more than thirty years ago. So it says the following. So if x omega in the strata H mu is a general point, is general. I will also be weak. General just means. Not special, okay. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. So it's, you can think of this general as being general in the sense of the geometry, so it's a general point. Then, the, so I'll also skip this GL thing, just write orbit closure, because I only have this one group action, then the orbit closure of x omega is the total space h mu. in case the space is disconnected, then the, the total connected component that contains x omega. Okay. The other one, if you take a general element in the stratum h mu, then look at this orbit closure or this group action, then you get this kind of uh, equidistribution properties. So, this, so the orbit just goes around the space. If you take the closure, it gets a whole thing. Nevertheless, this General assumption is important. In other words, I can give you some special differential x omega containing h mu, so that if you take the orbit closure, it only cuts out a proper subspace. It's not a total thing. Okay. So uh, again, as a remark, so there exists. I'll give you examples. Special x omega mu such that this orbit closure. Is properly contained but not equal to the total space. Okay. So let me give you an example to convince you such special orbit closures exist. <coughs> so what would be the most special one? You can think about it this way. So I have a GL2R which is real four-dimensional, right? Real complex two-dimension. 
but there's a, like a complex one dimension thing is obvious and is obvious to understand because I can consider like a diagonal matrix with lambda lambda zero zero where lambda is a positive real number that means I just rescale my differential by like size lambda right it does not change the complex structure just rescale the differential by like real rescaler lambda I could also consider like S O two just means rotation right. I can rotate my polygon. That changes the differential just by rotation. It does not change the underlying complex structure. I could consider modulo this redundant action if I really consider the true <coughs> part of the action that I don't understand. And then I reduce to one dimension, complex one dimension of the action. In some sense, you can just, that means you consider your differential omega modulo C star. C star can be regarded as this SL2 rotation and uh, plus this real scaling. So if I modulo C star, I can think of, OK, I only consider the underlying conical divider. In some sense, I can project this x omega to the modular space of curves just by remembering x only, forget omega. The most special orbit, well, if it happens, maybe even before you take the closure, you just get the projection in mg as a complex one-dimensional algebraic curve. If that happens, it's certainly the orbit closure will never be the total space h mu. So it's only a complex one-dimensional. If you use this rescaling thing, it's complex two-dimensional. But usually, this space has much higher dimension. So those special orbits called they are called tech mirror curves because their image inside Mg form algebraic curves. So let me introduce them. Then I'll show you some examples. So recall, so I have this projection. Which mu you see inside the half bound orbit is also maps to mg. So this map may not be dominant depending on the signature mu. So this my does have smaller dimension compared to mg. But in any case, the map is easy to understand. If I have a pair as omega, so I forget the differential, I only remember the underlying curve, I map it to x, which belongs to mg. So this is a smooth genus g curve. Okay. So here I have some orbit. I can just forget the differential project down to mg. So if this orbit projection mg itself, even before it takes a closure, forms a quasi-projective curve in the algebraic sense, okay, then I call it a tech mirror curve. So if oh, orbit projection in mg itself forms a, an algebraic curve, Then it is called a tech mirror curve. So secure curve means complex one-dimensional curve. Okay, so real two-dimension. So that would certainly be a very special orbit because it's already algebraic. It takes a closure; it just remains to be itself. Okay, so. So indeed, for every stratum h mu, it contains infinite many such tech mirror curves. Let me give you a uniform construction, which arises from using a branch cover. Okay. So, so let me maybe introduce a general setup of such branch cover constructions, and I will specialize to one example. So maybe the construction of tech mirror curves using branch covers. Okay. Let's consider the following branch cover. So how do you describe a branch cover? You need to know the genus of the domain curve and the target curve. You need to know the degree of the branch cover. And also you need to know the ramification type. How many branch points are there over each branch point? What is the ramification type? <coughs> so, so let I introduce a notation. I call it H D G mu, 
Yeah, I'll join top mu here. So mu is still the same zero type mu, and d is some degree, and g is the genus of the Riemann surface X. B, the Hori space. So Hori space usually stands for uh, the parameter space parameterizing branch covers. So which kind of branch cover do I consider? Be the Hori space parameterizing the following branch covers. So my data mm -hmm. is that I want to consider so let's call it pi from x to e, okay, which is of degree d. So maybe let's write down the condition. So where x is of genus t and e is genus one. So e is a elliptic curve, okay. And our degree of pi is given by this integer d. Okay, I fix the degree. And there's one last important condition. So pi has a unique branch point. So it's called q in e. And well, I only have one branch point, but upstairs over Q, there might be many, many ramification points. They all map to Q. I need to specify the ramification type. So let me write it, say, this way, and the ramification. I'll give you an example of that. <laughs> type over Q is determined by this zero type mu. It's mu. Well, this I'm going to explain, but let me just close up this bracket so that I have defined the uh, Hurry space. Whereas so the last sentence I need to explain. Okay. Other than that, I hope the rest part is clear. I consider branch covers between all possible genus G curves and genus 1 curves of degree D such that this branch cover has a unique branch point. See, at the origin, denoted by Q in the ellipse curve, we are over Q I have a bunch of ramification points, but this ramification type is mu. What does this mean? So let me explain this. <coughs> so this means, this sentence means, i.e., so over Q, there are, what is mu here? Let's recall mu is the signature m1, mn, so which, is a part, which is a partition of 2t minus 2. So over q, there are exactly n ramification points. Let's call them p1 up to pn. And each pi has ramification order given by the corresponding entry mi. Okay. So mu is already fixed. So it has n entries. I require the branch cover has this exactly n ramification points over q such that each ramification point pi has ramification order given by that entry mi. But then that d is a so let me explain. I, I think I understand what you are going to ask. So let's check whether this makes sense. Okay. First, let's check by Riemann Horowitz. In order to make sure this branch cover exists, so the data should satisfy the Riemann Horowitz formula. It tells us two times the genus of x minus two is equal to d times the two times the genus of, maybe let's write this, e minus two, plus the total ramification order, so this is a standard Riemann-Hurwitz formula for branch covers. Right? Let's check, this is just 2t minus two, so this is two times one minus two, this term is gone, so I just get 2t minus two is equal to sigma mi. Well, that's exactly my assumption. So the sum of the mi is 2t minus 2. So it matches with the Riemann-Hurwitz formula. 
for the first place. But I may have other pre-image over Q, but those are not magnified. Yeah. So when I see that PI, there are ramification points. So the picture looks like, OK, I may have E here, and this is a special branch point Q, OK? So I may have something like this, OK? And uh, some other ramification points. And uh, let's do one more. So these are the see, P1, which is a ramification order one, but it's because there's two sheets. Here I have P2, which is, looks like ramification order two, because I have three sheets. But then I may have some other isolated one. But those are not ramified. You only need to add up the degree to be D. But these are okay, they are local isomorphic. These are ramification order zero, these are not counted. But you need to make sure the total degree is equal to D. But only the special points are P1 up to Pn. So does this answer your question? Yes. OK, so in principle, this branch cover certainly exists. Okay. So this condition also guarantees you can make D arbitrarily large. So there's no condition on D, because D times 0, so D can be arbitrarily large. So it's really important you consider the source curve, so the target curve is of genus 1. Otherwise, if it is positive, then you only have finite many choice for D. OK. okay. Well, so, so far, this has nothing to do with, with differentials. Where do I cook up these forms, omega? Well, look, if you have a branch cover, if I have a differential on E, I can pull it back via pi, right? So now E is a torus. See, let's just take, say, for example, standard torus given by dz, nowhere vanishing. And I can pull it back by pi. So now, let So I can, so I have already explained this part, let me erase it, this part just, it's a double check. So, so let dz be, be um, a standard, uh, yeah, it's a non-trivial different form on E. Then let's consider omega equals pi four back dz. Okay, this is a different form on on x. Okay, I can pull back the form. And the riemann hertz formula actually originally comes from if you pull back conical line bundle, or you pull back a different form and look at the underlying zero. So you remember first, I already, already erased it, but really says the following. So it's uh, like not only the numerical version, but the true like, divisorial version. So you remember first, again, tells us the underlying zero of omega is exactly given by the ramification points with the ramification order. That is M1, P1, plus M1, P1, okay? And you can also check this easily by local calculation because, say, at pi, the map pi is given under suitable coordinate by, say, z maps to, because the ramification order is mi, so the actual map should go to z maps to z to the mi plus 1. That tells you the ramification order is this exponent minus 1. Okay. Sorry, I already used Z. Maybe let me change the letter. So U goes to U to the Mi plus 1. Okay, see, this is my local coordinate Z in the torus. Now, if I pull back DZ, that means I just need to differentiate U to the Mi plus 1, right? Then omega equals pi pull back DZ. That is D of this U thing. But that is exactly up to this mi plus 1 factor, u i, sorry, u to the mi times du i. Okay. u to the mi times du. That tells us if I pull back this differential and at a ramification point of ramification order mi, I do get a zero of one order mi, right? So that explains this 
relation. And that actually is a proof of the Riemann Hurwitz formula if you think about it. So it's very easy. Okay, so I cooked up a differential satisfying the condition so omega has exactly the zero type specified by mu, right? So this omega actually this tells us omega and x belongs to the strata h mu because omega has a zero type given by mu. So I have a branch cover. I take the standard differential from E and pull it back under this branch cover. I actually get a special differential sits inside h mu. Okay. Now the next thing, so does this part make sense? Any question? So we call the differential. What I want to explain is this has something to do with this GL2 uh, action, right? Why well, claim? So this HDG mu thing modulo is rescaling the differential by the C star action. Actually, it's already a uh, orbit invariant. It's invariant under the GL2 action. Anyway, right. Okay, I got it here. So the claim is that so this HDG mu is invariant under the group action. Before I convince you this claim holds. Let me represent such branch cover in a different way, because we have always this polygon expression from a different form. Right? You may wonder, okay, if I take E and DZ to be, say, the unit square, then if I look at this branch cover, how does the covering surface X look like? It must be, suppose I have degree D, so I have to take D copies of the unit square and glue them together to form a branch cover. Right? So let me give you an example. Now you can say HDG mu is the inside of HG mu, right? You can map it to MG. Oh. So, so far here, it's not quite, uh, because... But your action is all now in H mu, right? My action is on H mu, yes. You can think of this... <laughs> yeah, if you want, you can think of this inside H mu or in the projectivized H mu. It depends on whether you want to rescale this omega or not. When I see that this is invariant, maybe I should say this is modulo of the C star thing. Yeah. But so. in that way, I mean, uh, this is not, uh, maybe it has an intersection with a different D, right? I fixed D. Oh, you fixed D? D, D is fixed. All the number D, okay. G, and mu, they are fixed. For each D, I, I get this one query space. And for different D, I get different hurry spaces. Yeah. So here D is fixed. G is fixed and mu is fixed. Maybe actually before that claim is another thing is that to this hurry space actually is of complex one dimensional. Maybe it's just an important thing to keep in mind. That's why it corresponds to a tech mirror curve is complex one dimensional. The reason is because, look, we describe a uh, branch cover, right? So what do you need? I only need to take this genes one curve with a special ramification point. But well, that is a modular space of elliptic curves. That is M11, which is complex one dimension. Once I know that, so up to isomorphism, there are only finite many different covers, because that is a chorus number counting problem. Right? You might get more than one cover, but still finite many. In other words, this chorus space admits a finite morphism to M11, the modular space of elliptic curves. Okay. But M11 is one dimension, so its curve space is also one dimension. Okay. So maybe let me write down. This is because this HDG mu maps to the modular space of genus 1 curve. So this parameterizes the target curve E on the Q. So this is a finite morphism. This degree of this finite morphism is called the Hurst number. 
just counting over a fixed E and Q, how many non-isomorphic covers are there. But it's this is finite, always. So this is one dimension, so that is also one dimension. OK? So let me continue to show you an example to just explain this claim. Give you an example. Okay. Let me take D equal to 5, a genus equal to 2, a mu is, so 2G minus 2 is 2. Let me take a like double zero, OK? So let, let me also take E to be the standard unit square. This is E. And I'll put Q on the vertex, OK? So the edges are glued in the standard way, OK? OK, I get the flat horse. Now I want to take D5. That means I need five copies of this uh, flat towers and glue them together. Okay. I have one, two, three, four, five. Maybe that's good. Just means I have five squares, okay. So each is isomorphic to this unit square. But I glue them in a special way. So I glue them like this. So I also need to tell you how the edges are identified. So let me do it like this. So this edge is glued with this edge. And this long edge is glued with this long edge. Okay. So this one is glued with this one. And this edge is glued with this edge. If you compare the first example I showed you yesterday, so remember I showed you an octagon picture. Oh, this is also octagon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight edges. It's not convex, but it's okay. And you can check that after gluing, the eight vertices still become the same point. So this actually lives in the strata H2. It's a genus two surface with a differential admitting a double zero as the vertex. This is really the same picture I presented in the first example, this octagon picture, although the polygon now looks like not convex and a little weird, it's tiled by square. So such surface called a, like a square tiled surfaces because it's covered by squares. In other words, so this square tiled surface is actually is another interpretation for such branch cover if you take E to be the standard torus. So this map, this is my x. So this map is pi, it's 5 to 1, OK? Which is only um, branched at q. Clearly, any interior point is not branched. And if you look at the ramification point, there's only one ramification point at the vertex in this case, that is p. And you take the differential dz here, pull it back, you get omega, as I computed earlier. It belongs to the strata h2. So did you get this picture from four point corresponding to eight point, but because of the... Uh, Say it again, why four point? Yeah, I, I understand that there are five squares. squares yeah. I don't know why this picture, how, how did you get this, this picture? You mean like uh, the reason how this picture showed yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Well, so... Let me explain, maybe first let me explain this action scene, then I'll come back to how in general to, to produce this picture, okay? So let me finish uh, convincing you the claim, and then I'll come back to your question. The thing now I have this GL2R action, right? So really the GL2R action is exchangeable with this current picture, because I can also, what do I mean by GL2R? It's affine transformation, right? So but my surface here actually is tiled by squares. I only need to change the shape of each square, so I still glue in the same way. So suppose I have a matrix A, it's a two by two matrix. I can just change, apply A, then this square becomes another parallelogram. Whatever it is, it's some parallelogram. Okay, this is action A, okay. This is the other one. Well then I just take five copies of this parallelogram and put them together in the same way.
right? So still like one, two, three, four, five. And I still glue the edges in the same way, and the eight vertices were identified to be the same vertices. So this clearly lives in the same strata. In other words, so this covering thing, I still get another thing, let's call it pi as well. So this is still five to one cover, and satisfies the same gamification condition. So, so this picture just serves as a proof, right? So this whole space is in under this CR action, because this action is exchangeable by exchange, changing the shape and size of E first, but then I take still the parallelogram as my building block to glue together to form this surface. And this still lives in the same strata and also as an element in the same query space. Okay. So why action is compatible with this covering? Oh, this GL2R action. Yeah. yeah, so this is compatible with this covering. Yeah. yeah, I'm saying so I GL2R X here. You can go like this, or you can go also go like that. And this lives in the same query space, this guy. Also lives in the HDG mu, right? So that tells us this space is invariant under this action. Does this make sense? So my action is on this strata, right? But I'm saying you are really acting on <laughs> this building block first. But after I get another building block, I still build the same surface. Just off. And this, you can check that this clearly, this from here to there, still this is given by the same alpha transformation A, right? I just fix this part one by one. Okay. So let me come back to Professor Lee's earlier questions. How does this picture show up? That's the reason why I also label them by one, two, three, four, five. So if you have ever worked with a branch cover, you know, in order to describe a branch cover, you need to take a small loop around each branch point and go around this loop, and that would induce a monotone action mapping to the symmetric group of degree D. That means upstairs you have D sheets around mm -hmm. the ramification point. If we go around, what happens to the D sheet? You may exchange some of them. That will give you an like element in the symmetric group of acting on the D letters. So in this case, we have a torus. So the fundamental group of the torus uh, with one marking, uh, like this branch point, I only have one ramification loop. So it looks like the following picture. So this is a monodromy um, expression of a branch power. So in this case, let me take E here. To make it easier, let me shift the branch point in the interior. So just take a different presentation. I'll take another base point B. Now I have, yeah, so I have um, some loops. Let's call these loops. This is A and A, sorry. So this is, well, let me just call it alpha and alpha. This is beta and beta. I take a, another loop going around Q. This is a unique branch point one, so let's call it gamma. Okay. So the branch cover containing HDG mu, so pi and HDG mu, corresponds the following data. What I have to do is I want to consider alpha, let me also abuse my notation. So when I write down alpha, beta, gamma, so not only for the loops, but also I consider their induced monodromy um, classes in the symmetric group SD, okay? So alpha, beta, gamma inside the symmetric group of SD such that So this alpha, beta, gamma, they are not independent elements. They satisfy some relation in the fundamental group of the torus, right? If I go like alpha, beta, alpha, inverse, beta, inverse, this commutator so is the same as homologous to going around gamma, right? With this puncture. So alpha, beta, alpha, inverse, beta, inverse, 
is equal to gamma. So that guarantees they are consistent. Nevertheless, I need one more condition. The ramification type over Q has to be given by this mu, right? So that ramification type really means if I go around gamma once, up there, the D sheets, how do they change? So I would say that, so this is one condition. And moreover, I would say that gamma is of type. If you have a ramification point of ramification order M, that means really M plus one sheets come together. So that means gamma will contain a cycle of length M plus one. For example, if you have a ramification order one, that means two sheets come together, maybe it's the two sheets you label them by one, two, that means gamma has a cycle consisting of one, two. So gamma is, in that sense, I will write gamma is of type, say M1 plus one, maybe let's write it this way. Um, yeah, so maybe, uh, let me think for a second. Maybe let me just say a gamma is of type mu in the sense that gamma has um, cycles of length m1 plus 1, m2 plus 1, and mn plus 1, and then a bunch of 1s. But these ones correspond to a non ramified point, just local isomorphism. So these are these non trivial ramification points coming from the entries of mu. Okay. So that this number adds up to be D. Right? I have a, a controversy class type specified by mu. That's what I mean. I guess one confusing thing sometimes you have to be a little careful about whether you use mi or mi plus one. But when I see ramification order, that means if you have z maps to z to the case, then k minus 1 is ramification order. So the exponent should be the m plus 1. Okay. So once you have this data, you can actually recover or construct a branch cover. Right. You can just take d copies and using this relation and glue them together. This relation means this gluing is consistent, and the other condition guarantees you get the desired ramification type mu over q. So let's come back to this picture. So actually here you can read off alpha, beta, and gamma. Let me just show you alpha and beta because gamma is, then is determined. So applying to this example, so what is alpha? Alpha is this horizontal cycle, right? Maybe let me also shift alpha a little bit up. So suppose this is the direction of alpha. You can actually say, sorry, this is alpha, but this is action of uh, molybdenum action upstairs. So that means alpha goes from here. So it shrinks 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. When these two edges are glued together, five, 4 maps back to 1. It tells us alpha will be as an element, yes, as 5. 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes back to 1. And 5 is fixed, right? So these two edges are glued together, so five. So this is alpha, yes, yeah, five. So beta, suppose I use this vertical one, beta. So I have beta here. So it sends one to five and five back to one because these two edges are identified. And for all the others, so two goes back to two. So these are identified, and three goes back to three, and four goes back to four. Two, three, four. Okay. And also, let's check what is a commutative alpha, beta, alpha, inverse, beta, inverse. <coughs> so let's take one here, so, so my composition goes this way. So I start from alpha here, take one. So one goes to two, and two in beta is fixed. And two in alpha inverse goes back to one, and one in beta inverse goes back to five. Right? So one goes to five. Okay, then let's start from five. Five is fixed in alpha. 
and 5 in beta goes to 1. And in alpha inverse, 1 goes to 4. And in beta inverse, 4 is fixed. So, and let's check 4. So 4 in alpha maps to 1. So in beta, 1 goes to 5. In alpha inverse, 5 is fixed. So in beta inverse, 5 goes to 1. So that means I close up. Okay. Similarly, you can check that. So 2 and 3 are both fixed like this. So alpha, beta alpha inverse, beta inverse gives you this cycle in S5. But that's exactly what I mean of type mu, right? Because mu is 2. That means this is my gamma, right? The gamma needs to have a cycle of length 2 plus 1, 3. So this is one length 3 cycle. And the other is just length 1. I don't care. They do not give any ramification point. Just means there are some other ordinary vertices maps to Q, but locally isomorphic. So conversely, if you have these cycles, it looks like I just have this 1, 2, 3, 4. I put these four squares here. I have another 5 here. I just need to make sure it's consistent with the beta thing. Because there is also this geometric correspondence before this monodromy description and this square tau description. So does this answer your question? Yeah, so from the, this picture, I understand <laughs> this. But from only this information, to understand the picture is still hard, right? From which information? Only from the dead information, t equal 5, g equal 2, mu equal 2. Oh, but is. I'm saying, so if you have this picture, you can just I make... already have a picture, then... Oh, I but if you have this information, uh -huh. without the picture, I can, I can yeah. still get that. Yeah. But then you just need to write down all possible uh -huh. elements to satisfy that there are finite many choices, right? Uh -huh. It's a finite group, uh -huh. right? So that's exactly the Horst counting problem. And you have to write down elements in a symmetric group SD, satisfying this condition where this gamma is of specified conjugacy type. Whenever you give me a tuple alpha beta gamma, I can just use it to write down this square tau expression. So this is a Horst counting problem. But in any case, there are only finite many choices. The number grows with D and G very quickly. Nevertheless, whenever you give me one, I can write down this expression. This message can be used to prove that HDG mu is non-empty? Uh, more or less, more yeah. Less. yeah. There's a more intrinsic way to compute it, uh, to show, well, let me see whether I want to say it. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just spend some time explaining. There's, yeah, so this, if you can show this Hurry's tuple always exists, certainly that tells us this space HDG mu is not empty. But there is even a, a more intrinsic way to, to do it, let me, and which is also useful. Um, but so far, I have already explained this Hurry space. Maybe let's go to the punchline. It's invariant on this action, so that it gives you a candidate for tech mirror curve. Right? It's complex one dimensional algebraic. So. so if you don't have question about this part, I will erase. So the conclusion is that so we the curve space HDG mu gives that mu curves. And indeed, in principle it gives infinite many tachymere curves, actually. As D goes to infinity. Because I told you, by the Riemann Hurwitz formula, there's no constraint on D. You can take D up to large. So every strata, indeed, contains infinite many such technical curves. But these are very special, because this is come from branch cover construction. If you let me put random remark. So there exist other technical curves, not from HDG mu. Okay. People have discovered examples of other tech miracles not from HDG mu, but those, like non branch cover related tech miracles, are much, much harder to, to find. They are very rare. Even in low genus, you may do a very special construction, either using polygon or using some other method. But in any case, 
to the classification is still open. If you want to find all tachymeric curves, by modulo this branch cover thing, so how many others are there? People don't have a complete answer. It's still open. Is it possible to this uh, rectangle square three pool to, to below, below one pool? You can't, I mean, the, the, the presentation is not canonical, right? You can always cut and paste to present it in a diff different way. But I'm just saying this way is easier to see the monodromy uh, actions. You can always yeah, cut it on here and move it down, right? Because these two edges are glued together, I can certainly take this square and move it down. But then you have to remember this edge and that edge are glued together. So city folk can be cut and then... Yeah, so you can cut it even like, like not horizontally, just like a diagonally and represent it looks like not square anymore, but... Yeah. I, told, I said the polygon presentation sometimes is misleading because it's yeah. not canonical, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or you might want to find a, like a nice expression or a presentation of this differential using this way so that you can see clearly it comes from this branch cover. I still have 10 minutes for uh, the first lecture today, so maybe let me come back to the question. So um, there's another property about this kind of branch cover related to mirror curves. Maybe let me put this with remark. So let's give it, some, it's, I'll give it a name. So if pi from this x to e belongs to HDT mu such that so let me here really take E to be the standard square towers okay, I'm really take the special G invariant to the square towers okay? so the E is a standard torus square unit square okay so let's label it this is this is E really this is 1 this is I so it's a common square I take this special square and I take omega is really pi pull back dz, okay? Yeah, dz is also the standard current z on the Euclidean plane. So we are x and y, they're really horizontal or vertical. I'm not taking other parallel graph. Okay. Then, this omega, I explained lives in the strata h mu, but actually omega corresponds to integral, like lattice points, in h mu under the period coordinate. Actually, this condition is there only, if, so let me put it this way. So. Is it current? So let me put this with this guy. Is it current to this omega x omega inside h mu is a lattice point. I'll explain what I mean under pure current. So what do I mean by lattice point? So let me explain that. That is, so, I mean, so under the pure coordinates, so x omega looks like. So I have a bunch of purists, right? I use it as local coordinates. Under this coordinate system, this point has coordinate looks like z plus belongs to, maybe let's say. Yeah, so this is my lattice, right? So square root of minus one times here. In other words, I really consider the lattice spanned by just by this lattice, one i for each coordinate entry. So I'm seeing this x omega, each coordinate really has integral real part and integral imaginary part. That's what I mean by the lattice point. Okay. And this is very strong. This is an if and only if. In other words, if you have such branch cover, it gives you a lattice point. Conversely, if you give me a lattice point in the strata, it actually must come from this branch cover of the standard torus. The proof is quite simple. Okay. So let me only show you one direction to convince you, then we'll stop for the first half. 
So maybe let's use this direction, okay? That means suppose I start from this branch cover, okay? So I'll show you under pure coordinates, x omega must have integral you are the imaginary parts for each coordinate. So what can I do is that, remember, so what is the period? The period coordinates come from, I take some gamma and integrate omega, right? So this direction. So this gives me some period. So where gamma is an element in the relative homology. That's P1, Pn. So here gamma could be an absolute period or a relative period, doesn't matter. Okay. So, but this is part of the current system. I have to convince you this belongs to this lattice, then I, I will be done. But omega comes from pi pulled back dz, right? Okay. Now I can apply the pull back and push forward formula. So this is really the same as pi push down gamma. And I, so, so far this is in x. So this integral is still in x, so this integral is in e, right? because pi push down is in e. So I do dz. But the thing is, gamma, if gamma is itself is a closed loop, then the image is still the closed loop. If gamma is not a closed loop, it must connect one of the pi to another pj. But look at my branch cover. I require all the pi's are mapped to the same point q, right? So the key point is pi pi is really equal to any pi pj and equal to q for any ij. That tells us this pi push gamma is a closed loop in e. But that means it belongs to the integral homology of e, and the integrate dz I always get integral real and imaginary parts, right? So I get some multiples like that or some multiples like that. So this clearly belongs to z plus square root. So conversely, if you give me a lattice point here, then you can sort of reverse this procedure to cook up a branch cover. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you to think about. And now if you have this stratum, you still have to show the strata is not empty. But you think about it, if I take the strata here, h mu, right? If I know the strata is not empty, it has some interior, then I have some local period coordinates, right? I can just rescale the strata because omega can be up to large. So the strata looks like uh, some kind of a cone. The inside, it must have infinite many lattice points. These lattice points. In this sense, right? Whenever I see a lattice point, I get such branch cover. That means, at least for d large enough, these branch covers should always exist. That also tells you there are infinite many. And indeed, it tells us the uni of these branch covers, they are, in some sense, under the analytic topologies, they are dense because they are lattice point. The union of this HDT mu for d to infinity is dense in the structure. Right, because they are lattice point. So if you take the closure, it gets a whole space. Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs>